Uh, my brothers and sisters, I greet you again in the name of our precious Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the Savior of mankind, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, for whom are all things, by whom are all things, and through whom are all things, who is the same today, tomorrow, and forever he doesn't change now what i want to do today is to talk about <clears throat> the necessity of christ jesus our lord becoming a man now this is very important because i think that if we can understand this we will understand a lot of things that tend to escape our attention. So to, 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 to kickstart the discussion, I will use for, for a text, Hebrews chapter 2, and we will start from verse 5. We have used this text before. But today I'm using it focusing on something else different. We'll start from verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 2. For he did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you remember him? or the son of man, that is the son of Adam, that you are concerned about him. You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and you have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, let me read up to the end of verse 9. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Um, we thank you, Father, for your precious word. Your word is truth. Sanctify us by your word. Bless it to our hearts that we may grow thereby in Jesus' name. Now, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> the question that has troubled the church, and every time I say the church, I don't want you to think about a denomination. I'm not talking about a particular denomination, I mean the, the church, that is the body of Christ. Something that has troubled the church since all the apostles passed on is the doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who was he? Was he only a man? Was he only God? Was he both God and man? Who was he? Was he an angel? Was he lower than angels? Was he higher than angels? Was he a created being? Or was he eternal? These are the big questions that have troubled the church. And because of these big questions, a lot of teachings that are erroneous arose and so if you are a student of uh, Christian history, you will know that there were lots and lots of church councils that were held 
to deal with these cancerous teachings that were arising uh, regarding the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so one of these was the dispute about whether he was truly a human being or he was just having a phantom board, that is a board that appeared to be like human even though he was not. Was he truly human or not? These are big questions that you have to be understood by a Christian. Now the doctrine that the church is always held to is the doctrine called the doctrine of incarnation. Incarnation means to be enfleshed, which means something already exists, then something is added to it, which is the flesh. So the enfleshing of the word is what we mean by the doctrine of the incarnation. That is when the word becomes a true human being, the enfleshing of the word so that it becomes a real human being. That's what we mean by the incarnation. Now, David, a man truly blessed by God, speaking prophetically, the spirit of Christ speaking through him, writes Psalm 8, and the psalm is talking about man. He says, Oh God, when I look at the starry hosts, the galaxies, the constellations, when I think about the various planets that you created, remember that the Earth is a very, very small planet compared to the other planets that don't have human beings. Sometimes it's more, it, it is multiplied several thousand times by the size of the other planets, right? When I think about these, and some of the stars are even much bigger than the, than the Earth. So when I think about the works of your hands, the works I see in the heavens, the clouds, the firmament itself, the galaxies, the planets beyond what we can see. I wonder, who is man, that speck of dust as he is, who is man that you care for him so much? Who is he? Even when I look at this earth in which he finds himself, if I think of the mountains, the oceans, the creatures in the seas, the birds of the air, the, 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 the forest, the huge expanses of forests, the wetlands, you name it. Who is man? The speck of dust as he is. Who is he that you care for him so much? This is the question that David has at heart. And it's a, he is asking these questions genuinely. In a spirit of worship, he is amazed at how God cares about men. Listen, he says, You made him for a little while lower than the angels. Yet, you crowned him with glory and honor. Now, if you look at that verse, what is he saying? He's saying, when I think about men, I see that truly he cannot compare to angels. If one angel descends to this place, there will be a mighty earthquake that can destroy buildings and mountains can split. Men cannot do that. Yet I'm surprised. When I look at the rank that you gave men, you gave me a rank much higher than that of angels. Even if for a little while you made him a little lower than angels, you made him lower than angels. 
Now, this is a puzzling fact. Now, why, why, why the writer of the letter of the Hebrews takes so much time to unpack this? It's because once people say Jesus Christ is a human being, then they say, then he is inferior to angels. Angels don't die. If he is a man, surely he dies. He is much lower than angels. So why should God, a pure spirit, a pure spirit, live in a, in a form that is much lower than the angels he created? This is the question that troubles people. This is the question that troubles people. But David, seeing this in the spirit, says, I see that you really made him for a small time, for a short period. You made him smaller than angels. But what amazes me is that you gave him a higher rank than angels. Because that, the, the idea that you crowned him with glory and honor simply means you gave him a higher rank than angels. Yet you made him lower than angels for a season. Why? Because all the works of the hands of God have been subjected unto his feet. Angels are part of the works of God. They were created by God. The galaxies, the universe as we see it, the oceans, the seas, the mountains, every creature that you can imagine, they were all made by God. And men, lower than angels for a little while as he was, he was and indeed still is crowned with glory and honor, which means he has a higher rank than them. Hmm. Indeed, the, 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 the one who, the, the writer to the, of this letter, passes a comment after citing this portion of Psalm 8. And he says, For in subjecting all things to him, that is to men, he, meaning God, left nothing that is not subject to him, that is to men. But now we do not yet see all things subject to him. Man is in trouble with the creation. Man, when he was first created, if you remember Genesis chapter 1, let us make man in our own image and our own likeness. God created man male and female, in his own likeness. And he set men over all the works of his hands. That is in relation to the earth. That's what God did. He subjected the entire earth unto men. He said to men, have dominion over everything under the sun. Birds of the air, fish of the sea, mountains, beasts, you name it. Everything was subjected unto his feet. And notice, even the task of giving the animals names was left to Adam. And it is Adam who gave these animals their names. It's there in scripture. It's there in scripture. He is the one who gave these animals names. One by one, he gave them names. That was Adam. Now, naming something implies that you own it. Doesn't it? 
If you read, for example, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, maybe up to verse 20, I just want to give you a sense. Then the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. God really delegated the task of giving these creatures names to men. And when, whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. This is what the Bible says. Man exercising tremendous authority over the created order of God, giving, na giving names to all the creation, that means all the trees, what ecologists and um, all taxonomists struggle to give names and all that. The Bible here says Adam gave everything its name. And the names he gave all these creatures were taxonomically correct. Because that's what God willed. Those are the names of the, cre the creatures. Now, having said that, I don't want to lose you in the process as I explain this. I want to move with you so that we, we get to understand what's going on here. Now, this alone, which I have read in Genesis, tells you that everything, birds of the air were given names by him. It means everything living and non-living that is under the sun was under the feet of Adam. Adam was a king. He ruled the earth. He ruled the earth on behalf of God. God gave him that authority to rule the earth. The earth has never been ruled by angels. It was subject to men. Only that man fell. Now, let's, let's move a step further. If I read Psalm 115, Psalm 115, Let's start with verse 15. It says, May you be blessed of the Lord, maker of heaven and... Uh, maybe I can start a little bit um, earlier so that you have a sense. Um, right. Let me start from about verse 12 of Psalm 115. It says, the Lord has been mindful of us. Just as Psalm, Psalm 8 says, you are mindful of men. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord. The small together with the great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Now listen to verse 16. The heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. What is the reference there? Giving the earth to the sons of men is a reference to God giving men dominion in the earth. He has given men the right to rule in the earth. But now what we notice is that since sin entered into the world, the creation rebelled against Adam. In the past, before he sinned, creation came to Adam. He had fellowship with the creation. But now, after he sinned, 
creation rebelled against man. Since then, he fights for his existence. The beasts of the field have turned their, 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 they have turned themselves against him. If they see men, they will tear him apart to pieces. Yet, before men sinned, they came to men to be given names. They looked to men for everything. But when men fell, creation indeed rebelled. As it is written in the word of God. On the day that Adam sinned, the Lord pronounced, since you have obeyed your wife, you have listened to your wife, and you have done what you were not supposed to do, cursed be the ground on account of your disobedience. Now, the curse that was pronounced on the creation because of the sin of Adam resulted in many things happening that were not there, for example, thorns and briars started to sprout from the ground, to grow from the ground. Men began to suffer to get just enough to live, to sustain himself. The creation rebelled against him. He lost his crown, that crown of glory and honor. He lost it. But there's someone who took it. Who is it? Who, 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 who accepted this authority when men lost it? Who did it? This is, this is very important. Now, if we read, for example, um, let's say from about um verse uh, second corinthians chapter 4 um let's read from about verse 3 verse 3 says and even if our gospel is veiled it is veiled to those who are perishing in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, the one who is being called the God of this world here is certain. The, the fact that he is called the God of this world implies that he is ruling this world. That's what it means. That's what it means. How did he get that authority to rule this world? He, he accepted that authority. He took it by force. Once men fell, he took it by force. The Lord Jesus, in some place, in the book of um, John, I think around, it could be chapter uh, 14 or 15 or 16, I don't remember the exact place, but you can always check. He says, speaking to his disciples, my time has come. The prince of this world who come against, who come for me, but he, he has nothing in me which means there is nothing, he cannot accuse me of anything. There is nothing, when he comes, I'm clean. There is nothing, literally nothing. He can do nothing to me. But uh, what I want there is the, the phrase, the prince of this world. So the devil is called the prince of this world. He is called the god of this world. And even the Apostle Paul teaching in Ephesians says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, dominions, and powers, and rulers of the darkness of this world, and wicked spirits in the heavenly places. These are fallen angels. In other words, 
when man lost his crown, it fell into the hands of the devil. And the devil began to rule the earth, which was supposed to be ruled by men. The devil now seized the power, and the power he seized was on account of the fact that as long as man was under sin, he was subject to death, and man lived all his days in fear of death. And the devil used the death as an instrument to control men. Don't you believe what I'm saying? That's what scripture says. If you go to verse 14 of um, if you go to verse 14 of um, this same chapter, chapter 2 of Hebrews, it says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. You see, here is the point. So, the earth is now being ruled by angels, fallen angels are ruling the earth. Now, they are terrorizing the creation and humanity. And now, David speaking by the Spirit, he sees that there is coming a man, his son, by promise. A son of Abraham by promise. One who will sit on David's throne, and in sitting on that throne, he will, as men should, subdue everything under his feet, as it was under the days of Adam. Before Adam sinned. Now, therefore, he says, you indeed made him a little lower than you, you, made him, you made him lower than angels for a little while. But this is the amazing thing. You crowned him with glory and with honor. And you, you appointed him Lord over all the works of your hands. We are talking about men here. Listen. The subject of all this discussion is men, 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 in the sense of Adam. In fact, where it says, or oh, the son of men that you are concerned about him, the Hebrew text actually says, or oh, the son of Adam, which means we are, we are really talking about men here. We are talking about men. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, let's move on a step further. Verse 9 now, say, now tells us, now remember, maybe let me give a little context. You, all we know from the beginning of this chapter, the law was given through the mediation of angels. So to, 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 to the people of Israel, angels were superior beings. And being of such glory and being the ones who introduced the law of Moses, who gave the law to Moses. It was impossible for people with a Jewish background who had not received the revelation to believe that Christ Jesus could be any superior to angels. That's the big issue here. So the writer of this letter is trying to show them. He even started in chapter 1 this theme of showing that Christ Jesus is far superior to angels. In chapter 1 he says, for example, to which of the angels did ye ever say, thou art my son? 
We see that he never said that to any angel. But to Jesus, he says, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. And in another place, when he brings his firstborn son into the world, or his only son into the world, God declares, all angels of God must worship him. Now, if, if angels worship Jesus, then Jesus is much, much superior to angels. That's what the writer is showing here. Yes, he was made for a little while lower than angels. He became weak like us. He was vulnerable. People could drag him by the collar, try to throw him over the, 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 this, the steep. People would try to, 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 to do whatever they wanted with him. People abused him like they abuse an ordinary human being. He, he ended a state of humiliation. He emptied himself of all those divine privileges. One who is worshipped by uncountable number of angels who sing holy, holy, Lord Almighty. Your glory fills the whole earth. Yet he came and for a season became lower than the beings he created with his own hands. Someone would say, no, no, but how do you know that Jesus created the angels? It is written in the scriptures, and I am not trying to create anything new in saying this. If, for example, you come to, uh, to, to Colossians chapter 1, just maybe let's start from verse 15. It reads as follows. He is the image of the invisible God, meaning Jesus, the firstborn of all creation. The word firstborn there does not mean that he is the first creature. That word in the original text is referring to rank. He has a place of rule. He is a place of preeminence. For by him all things were created. If he is the one who created, then he can be a created being. If he is the one who sustains the universe by the word of his power, just imagine uh, the complexity of him maintaining the universe to function as it does without any disorder and dislocation that cannot be done by a created being. It is the creator who can do it. It is the divine being who can do it. So, for by him all things were created. Now, let's underline the word all. We want to see what the apostle Paul says this all includes. Both in the heavens and on earth. Now, once he says that, it's clear. He created all things that are in the heavenlies and that are on earth, that are visible and that are invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is the clearest statement showing the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ to angels. Because those that are being regarded here as invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities, this is the hierarchy of angels, both in the fallen order of angels and in the glorious order of angels in heaven. There are archangels, arch archangels, the below them like that, like that. They have their angelic order. 
and he created all of them. So he, he can't be any lesser than angels. He's much, 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 much higher than angels. But he became a human being. It is his becoming a human being which made him lower than angels for a little while. That is, for the three and a half years he walked in the earth, he was a little lower. He was lower than the angels for that little while. But what was the purpose of him becoming lower than angels? Verse 9 gives us the reason. But we do see him, meaning Jesus, who was made for a little while. Notice the emphasis is that for a short time, for a short time, he was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. Because of the suffering, because of the suffering of death, this is the reason why he became lower than angels. It was so that he can die. The moment you say he was made, really the, in the original text, that phrase was made means he became. It means he already existed in, in, in another form, which is that of being God. But he ended into another form, which is that of being a human being. He enfleshed himself with humanity so that he could die. Remember that God cannot die. So for him to die, to test death for everybody, he had to be a human being first. And so he, for a little while, was made lower than angels so that he could suffer death. But here is the thing. That death was crowned with honor and glory. Now go back to the Psalm of David. The Psalm of David says, Who is man? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. But I'm amazed because you crowned him with glory and honor. Now, in the Psalm of David, it doesn't say it was his death which was crowned with glory and honor. It was Adam indeed was given glory and honor. He had a crown of honor and glory that excelled that of angels. Remember that angels are servants in the kingdom of God. They are ministering spirits. They even minister to men. The heirs of salvation, they minister to us. Now, here we now see the second man, the last Adam, becoming a man for the purpose that he should suffer death. But that death was crowned with glory and honor because that very death is the highest form of worship that God ever received. Why? Because according to Romans chapter 3, when men sinned in the past, God even gave, for example, Israelites a, a Levitical priesthood where they were killing animals. Those animals, the blood of those animals did not remove sin. It, it simply covered their sins and postponed God's judgment on sin. So Romans 3 verse 25 says, well, starting from verse 25, it says, being, I'm just paraphrasing, being justified freely by God's grace through faith, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, that is redemption, the ransom price 
that he prepared in Christ Jesus, whom he ordained or appointed to be a propitiation, that is a sacrifice that takes away the wrath, a sacrifice that appeases the offended party, whom he ordained to be a propitiation for sins through his blood. For this reason, I say, to declare God's righteousness. Because in times past, in the forbearance of God, when humanity sinned, he did not punish sin as he did. He suffered long with men. I say again, to declare the righteousness of God, so that it becomes clear to everyone that God is indeed very just. And the only one who has the right to justify someone who is ungodly, if that ungodly person believes in Jesus Christ. Now, here is how this glorifies God. The most excellent form of worship that the son rendered to the father was this obedience to the point of dying for men by the grace of God. Because God for all this while he had not rendered the verdict of punishing sin as he should truly do. But he he provisioned a system for covering the sins of men. And so he suffered long with us without judging us. There are few instances where he really showed that this is what he can do if he is angry because of sin. The case of Sodom and Gomorrah, he burned those cities down and the surrounding cities. But also the case of the, the great flood during Noah's times. Those were two instances. But all the other times, he really didn't do anything. He didn't punish sin as it should be. So what he did was, he punished sin fully to the fullest measure possible that satisfies his wrath against unholiness and ungodliness. He did it in Christ Jesus. That is why Isaiah, seeing this in the spirit, says, All oh, the punishment for our transgressions was upon him. He was smitten and broken on our account. He suffered the wrath of God on our account. God did it in the perfect sacrifice. That is Christ Jesus. So this death here was the most glorious thing that ever happened. From eternity to eternity, the most glorious thing. It was the highest form of manifestation of the glory of God. That a just God, so holy that he cannot tolerate sin, he found a way of upholding his justice, but also of showing grace, of showing his mercy to men. And this is what he did. So Christ Jesus became lower than angels for a little while for the purpose of dying, to test death for everyone. Now, remember that these people are already dying. The case of death, which followed Adam's disobedience, is upon them. And they are separated from God, which is the second death. They have no life of God in them. And now, the only solution to this death, to reverse this curse of the law, from from over them he who descends from heaven the lord from heaven he has to become a human being 
And in becoming a human being, he is now able to die. But there's something else that we must be careful about there. When he became a human being, according to Galatians chapter 4 verse 4, born of a woman under the law, the idea of under the law means he was governed by the law. He lived under the law and he obeyed the law to the fullest measure, the most perfect obedience that can ever be rendered to the law. Jesus Christ rendered that obedience. Now remember, he is the law giver. Only he who gives the law can leave his law to the most perfect extent of obedience. And that's what Jesus did. And therefore, having done that, having obeyed to the fullest extent, his death, therefore, renders the most Perfect sacrifice that satisfies the justice requirements of God. But also his obedience becomes that very righteousness which God will credit to our bankrupt, to our, to our dry accounts, to us who are bankrupt of righteousness. If we believe in God, he credits to us that righteousness of Jesus. Now that righteousness of Jesus having been credited to us, we have now been brought into the glorious kingdom of God. Into glory. Hallelujah. Indeed, verse 10 says, For it was fitting for him, that is Jesus, for whom are all things. Who had everything? He lacked nothing. He had everything. And through whom are all things? Everything was made by him and through him. In bringing many sons to glory, this death which was crowned in glory and honor, he had one objective, to bring many sons to glory. So that all these sons alongside him will exercise dominion again as Adam used to do. This is what is being discussed here. Someone would say, mm, preacher, you are now misleading us. Let me just give you a piece of these glorious Things that God does, these things too glorious to our ears. Sometimes we fail to understand this. Now, listen to this. Listen to this. I want to talk a little bit about what's happening to the creation. Now, uh, Romans chapter 8 from about verse 18. Sorry about the dogs barking in the background. For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Other manuscripts actually say to be revealed in us. For the anxious longing of the creation, that is the created order, the creation, the creation, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Now remember, Hebrew said, in bringing many sons unto glory. Here are the sons being discussed here by the Apostle Paul. For the creation was subjected to futility, that is to vanity, not willingly, but because of him, that is God, who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children 
of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. What he is saying here is, when God pronounced a curse on the creation on account of Adam's sin, creation was placed under bondage, not because creation disobeyed God, but he did it so that Adam would really suffer the consequences of his disobedience. But now the creation has been subjected to this bondage. It is not what it was. It is not the perfect creation it was before Adam tainted it with, with his sin. So the creation is also waiting for its renewal, for its restoration, for its redemption. That is why we are going to have a new heaven and a new earth. Don't you understand this? We're going to have a new earth where a lion and a lamb, a child and a snake who will be living in harmony as they used to do during the days of the pre sin Adamic time. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, the creation itself knows, the earth, this earth we are walking on today, knows that it will be redeemed one day. And so, indeed, the writer to the Hebrews is showing us that Christ Jesus, in becoming like us, that was the most glorious thing that not even a single angel could fulfill. In other words, this, this very death he suffered is the reason why he is far exalted above them, which according to Philippians, if we were to rush to Philippians chapter 2 as I wind up now, uh, watch this now. Philippians, it says, uh, let's start from about, um, uh, from about um, verse, verse 5. But we see Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, which means he was really God, did not regard equality with God, that is God the Father, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. He made, him of no, he made himself of no reputation. He forewent the privileges of his divine nature taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. The death we were told was crowned with glory and honor. To the point of death, even death on the cross, you see, this qualifying phrase, even death on the cross, is telling you the worst kinds of death anybody could ever experience in the Roman world was to die on the cross. The most shameful kind of death, the most scandalous kind of death, the most contemptuous. To die there was for the worst criminals, for the most condemned and reviled in society. That is the kind of death the, the Lord from heaven experienced. For this reason also, listen, for this reason, that is for this dying he did on the cross, God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, every name, whether of angels or whoever. He was given a name that is above every name. So that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, that is the angels, and on earth, that is man, and under the earth, the dead, and that every time will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And this brings glory to God the Father. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, this is too excellent. Brothers and sisters, 
it was necessary for our Lord Jesus Christ to experience death so that he can restore the glory, the crown of honor that Adam lost, the first Adam. This is why Jesus is called the last Adam, the second man. He is starting a new humanity which restores that which Adam lost. So that this new humanity will rule the new earth. It's all here in, in the same chapter. It's all here in the same chapter where we were reading. Um, only that people don't pay attention. If you read verse 5, it says, For he did not subject to angels the world to come. That phrase, the world to come, literally means the inhabited earth. So, so that new earth will be inhabited. Men will have that dominion which Adam used to have before he sinned. They will be ruling that universe again. That's what it means. Now, very interestingly, the Apostle Paul also shows that even though angels have accepted authority, that is the devil, he has accepted. You, you, you accept the authority from the hands of men. But now, I want you to see this. The Apostle Paul rebuking uh, the church of Corinth because they were dragging each other before civil courts for any disputes they had. He starts by saying, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, does, any, does any one of you when he has a case against his brother, dare to go to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Notice he's saying the saints will judge the world. What is that? The inhabited world. If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? He's just trying to show them that, look here, these are petty things you are troubling yourself with. You will be lords over angels. You will judge the angels. And here you struggle with little things. But brothers and sisters, let me thank you very much for lending your ear uh, to this presentation I made. In short, our Lord had to become a human being so that he can die. Not just die like any one of us. The death he dies was a redemptive death. It was a death which was propitiatory. It was a death which was there to save mankind from the wrath of God and to restore men to a position of glory and honor as he was initially created. Therefore, the Lord Jesus, in, in becoming a human being, yes, lower than angels for a little while, he in fact did what angels could not do, which is to become one like us and die. He really became a human being, so he could die for us. For what does the apostle say in that verse? He says, look here, he did not take the nature of angels because what he wanted to help were not angels. So he had to become one of us because he wanted to help us. He wanted to, to, to save us, to redeem us. So he took the nature of men, not that of angels. He took the nature of the seed of Abraham. So Jesus Christ became man. His death was a redemptive death. It satisfied the justice requirements of the law of God. It satisfied God and propitiated God and demonstrated the righteousness of God. And so this death was the most glorious death you can ever think about. You don't have to pity the Lord on that death. You must glorify him. It was a glorious death. Father, we thank you for your word. 
We pray that this word is blessed to the hearts of people, that they may be sanctified and grow thereby in Jesus' name. Amen.